Good morning, still. Um, we're running a little late, so I will try to be uh, as quick as I can. Essentially, I plan to pick up on some of the points in more detail that Dana has spoken about, about the sorts of systems, an idea of the principles around which we might think to build vocational and education and training systems that would be fit for the 21st century. Now, we spent a very interesting morning with the context being set of how technology is changing and how it is moving on. Uh, I was very interested to see one of those uh, machines that can go into a house and immediately recognize all of the problems and all of the things that need repairing and need to be doing. I actually have one of those machines. I, I, I actually, I married that machine. <laughs> so I understand how that works. But the idea is that at the moment, we need to move from a workforce of clay to a workforce of plastic. A workforce that is not brittle and broken at the, at, as change takes place, changes in environment, changes in temperature, but a workforce that is flexible, can be moulded, can be recycled and reused. And data that we have from CEDIFOP Skills and Jobs Survey indicates one of the reasons why. 53% of adult employees in the EU need to learn new things continuously. We also need, as Dana said, to raise skill levels in the EU, the EU skills agenda. 70 million Europeans with low levels of literacy and numeracy. And also around a quarter of adult employees have significant skill deficits. But it's important also to understand the context that we're not just talking about making people to fit the labour market. It's not just about people having to adapt to the ways of technology. We are actually training and teaching people to manage that technology, to make it serve our interests and serve us better. It is people that are at the centre of this. This is why the education training systems are so important. If we don't focus on the people, then we will have no one to buy the driverless cars built by robots. So we need the context of a focus on equipping people to manage and to improve things for ourselves. Again, this brings the idea, the idea of skill mismatch. Skill mismatch is not just about employers being unable to find the skills that they want, which has been the domin dominant narrative over the last few years. And education training systems have raised the level of education and levels of educational attainment in the European Union, and people have come into the labour market, and what do we find? We find 29% of graduates are overqualified for the job that they do. It is also about the jobs matching and using and developing the skills that people have. If we do not have good skills, good jobs, we will not develop the skills of the future. And again, the point that Dana made about demography. Although it does not look like it from the young, happy, healthy faces in this room, many of us will have retired in the next 10 years. That means that most of the workforce that needs to deal with the changes are, that are taking place are already here. And again, according to CEDIFOP skill forecasts, nine out of 10 job opportunities between now and 2025 will be to replace someone. And many of those people who will need to be replaced will be going on to retire. So, what is it that, what principles should we be looking to build a system around? It was interesting that Mark showed the, the photograph of a meeting of the European Council with various European leaders looking rather lost and rather puzzled. And questioning about whether or not they make the decisions. Well, the point is they do not. It is you that will make the decisions. The tri Treaty on European Union strict specifically forbids harmonization of systems in member states. It forbids the interference in the content and structure of those systems 
by, member st by the European level. The responsibility for the system of education and vocational education and training, it lies firmly with you. However, some of you may recall in the year 2000 at Lisbon, a goal was set for the European Union to be the most dynamic economy in the world with more and better jobs and one that was based on technological advance. The ideas of that have faded a little bit since the recession of 2008. But nevertheless, that initiative sparked off many others, including deep and lasting cooperation between member states in the area of vocational education and training. And in 2002, the Copenhagen process was launched. And for the past 16 years, member states have agreed common objectives about how they should improve vocational education and training systems. And basically what we have at the moment is we know what we should do. The problem is we are not yet clear how we should do it. And what I have here over the next couple of slides, that's all, are what I believe represent the a bringing together of the thinking over the last 18 years or so at the European level about the principles around which systems might be built. This is not a directive. This is not an instruction. It is, for me, the result of the analysis, the discussions and the debates about what ideas we need to build systems around to make them fit for the 21st century. And there, one that imparts key competencies as the basis for learning and work-related skills. This is the starting point. Now, exactly what those key competencies are is a matter for debate. Certainly, literacy and numeracy are in there. Member states are increasingly introducing entrepreneurship as well as a key a key skill. But certainly the need to manage the information is extremely important. Again, Mark talked this morning about the, the internet, the first internet. Well, we've actually been here before. Because if you look back in history, arguably the first internet was the printing press. The printing press in the 15th century took an obscure debate about faith and forgiveness by faith or forgiveness through works and exploded it across Europe, which changed people's lives forever. We too are in the context of information that is changing the way that we think, the way that we see things, and we need to learn to manage it. And part of those key skills must be to manage that information. The system must be comprehensive, inclusive and flexible, covering different learning needs at different points in time. We need to break the current age-bound system of education and training that we have. We base the system on a block of learning at the beginning of working life that is then, with a little bit of adaption from, it, from continuing training down the road, enables you to have a career and a job for the rest of your life. That thinking is no longer valid. If it is that 62% of children under 12 will do jobs that do not yet exist, how can we expect anybody at 19 to be able to know what it is that they want to do? How many of you at 19 knew what you wanted to do? I didn't. If I did, I probably wouldn't be here. But the point is, the systems need to move away from their current rigid, rigid attachment to particular ages. It also needs to move away from a rigid way of learning. We need to take into account formal and non-formal learning, work experience, and adapt existing skills to new demands. If I want to do a master's or even a degree, even at my advanced age, I can do it. I can go to the university as a mature, in my case, very mature student, and I can register and I can learn. If I want to become a plumber, it's very hard. If I want to become an electrician, it's very hard. We need to create the flexibility at the level of the trades and the traps and the, prof uh, and the professions, as well as at levels of higher education. 
Systems need to be responsive and relevant to labor market needs. And this means support through labor market intelligence and lifelong guidance. Big data is enabling us to find out what is happening on the labor market in real time. Now, that doesn't necessarily always help you straight away because you're, you can't adapt an education training system immediately to the demands in real time. But nevertheless, the amount of information that we have enables us to be able to examine the patterns on the labour market with much, in much more sophisticated ways. And there needs to be a loop where this information feeds in because the modernisation of vocational education training systems is not a once and for all exercise. In 20 years' time, your successors, both human and mechanical, will be in this room discussing how to adapt education training systems to the new needs of the 2040s. It is an ongoing exercise, and we must be prepared and ready for that. And increasingly, it needs a European dimension, which includes opportunities for mobility. Now, it is excellent news and a tribute to the negotiating skills of my colleagues in the DG employment that the amounts of money for Erasmus have been tripled and there will be more money available for mobility, for vocational education and training students. Nine billion euros. Nine billion euros over seven years. Now, if I tell you that Italy pays 185 billion euros a year in servicing its debt. You can see the sorts of numbers that we are talking about here. Mobility is a key tool of learning. We say that we want skills where people can adapt, people can organize, people can think, people can sort, uh, solve problems. And mobility provides opportunities for people to do that in a new learning context. And so mobility is too important to be left only to the European Union. An international dimension is, poor, is important, but also national mobility programs can be organized. And many countries do have them. Because if we want to develop the competencies we say we do, mobility provides an opportunity to do it. It does not mean that we have to send someone from San Sebastian to Liverpool in England. The system has to be cost effective with an appropriate balance of funding between government, enterprises and individuals. Now, this is crucial. We are still living in an age of austerity. I live in Greece. I've seen it. I understand what it means on both a national and also a personal level. And the balance and funding is hard to find. The money is always difficult to find. And the balance of the contribution of government, enterprises and individuals will change between the region, between the country and also across the European Union. Member states that have large multinational comp companies like France and Germany they use levies and they raise funds and recycle those back into training. Such a system is not necessarily appropriate for a country like Portugal, where 95% of its economy is dominated by small and medium-sized enterprises. So we need a balance, but we need a balance that reflects the structure and the nature of the economy. Now the point is, all the things that I've said about key competencies, making things, making things more flexible, having the balance between the, the funding between ent government enterprises and individuals. None of these things happen overnight, and none of them are happen in isolation. CEDIFOP has been in existence 40 years. And when it began, it looked at vocational education training systems and it explained them between different countries and it sort of talked about ways in which those things could be improved. It's only in the last 10 years or so that the link between VET and the labour market has become a consistent theme within vocational education and training and within CEDIFOP. 
it's increasingly clear that we can't change things in one part of the system that has no effect on the other part of the system. And so we need more holistic, systemic approaches, and that means we have to talk to each other. That means the, 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 exact, the exact same sorts of skills that we are saying that young people need as they enter the labour market. The ability to work in teams, the ability to negotiate, the ability to discuss, the strong interpersonal skills we need now. We need them here to build vocational education training systems and we need them to those skills to develop them in the future. One positive thing about some of the discussions that have been going on in the European Union is that people are now talking to people who never spoke to each other before. For example, in Malta, Malta is launching a new process of apprenticeships. It doesn't have a strong tradition of apprenticeships, it's launching a new one. It's introduced a new law. And for the first time, social partners are speaking to education providers. We need these partnerships. The other issue is, again, not only do we need partnerships within the education training system and labour market actors, VET needs to act in coordination with other services, such as welfare and health, and where appropriate, with the individual concerned. There are so many people who cannot be integrated into the labour market because they have a problem with the benefit system, with the social security system. We need to move away from these ideas. And we need to be able to build systems that focus on the individual if the individual is going to come into the labour market and be able to produce effectively for society and the economy. And lastly, that needs to be a key element of other policies. We have had many discussions on developing the green economy the importance of it and initiatives that have been taking, taking place, about its potential for job creation. And some people have said that in the green revolution is similar to the IT revolution, insofar as green skills will be as essential in the future as IT skills are now. This may be true. However, there is a major difference. The IT revolution was inspired and led by the private sector. The private sector invested in new technologies in order to improve productivity, to improve profitability. The green revolution is being driven by the public sector. It is the public sector that is deciding environmental standards. It is the public sector that are setting the rules in this area. However, there is very little link between policies to deliver the green economy and the training provided to deliver them. We have new codes for building, new materials that are being used, but very few countries or regions have plans linking the provision of the training to the transformation of the green economy. And so, that's it. So we'll be able to have coffee very soon. But the idea is that there are principles emerging after long debates, lots of coffee, lots of meals, lots of discussion in the European Union. Principles are emerging around which systems fit for the needs of the 21st century can be built. The responsibility for building those systems lies with you. And given the pace of change, we need to get on with it pretty quickly. Thank you very much.